Today on The High Republic Show, we're chatting with Claudia Gray and Daniel Jose Older to talk about Into the Dark and The High Republic Adventures. We meet the team behind the look of this new era in Star Wars and reveal even more High Republic exclusives because that's what we do here, baby. Grab your garden shears and meet because The High Republic Show starts right now. Over a thousand generations of Jedi Knights and Guardians of Peace and Justice. Greetings and salutations, Star Wars fans. Christina Ariel back again with the first ever second episode of Star Wars The High Republic Show. There's been so much new High Republic content since the last time we talked, and I think I can confidently speak for all of us in saying I'm fully invested. For starters, we've gone from Jedi facing off against space pirates and planet destroying ship debris to space pirates, planet destroying ship debris, and now sentient evil plants! Star Wars continues to be wild, y'all. So before we start our spoiler-filled conversations about everything High Republic from the past two months, let's take a look at where things stand on the High Republic timeline now. Years before the Great Disaster, Jedi Padawans Comac Vitus and Orla Jirini are in the middle of a hostage crisis, resulting in the death of Comac's master, causing him tremendous grief and a disturbance with the Force that follows him throughout his life. Flash forward to when Comac and Orla are now Jedi Knights aboard a ship on its way to the Starlight Beacon, when all of a sudden the Great Disaster occurs, forcing them off course and taking refuge on a seemingly abandoned space station. Overtaken by mysterious plants, the abandoned station has an overwhelming presence of the dark side emanating from mysterious idols inside. Wanting to investigate, the Jedi take the idols back to Coruscant, only to realize the idols weren't the source of the dark side, but instead were keeping it at bay. They decide to return the idols to the space station in hopes of remitting their miscalculation, but it's too late. The real evil known as the Drain Gear is released. But wait, there's more! The villainous Nile are moments from claiming the station for themselves. Fun! Elsewhere, Yoda, a crew of Padawans, and a Jedi Master with the nickname Buckets of Blood are on their own rescue mission when they encounter Markeon Roe in the Nile. Back at the station, Comac and Orla's backs are against the wall. Thinking quickly, the Jedi turn the Nile and the Drain Gear against each other in hopes of escaping. But the Drain Gear use their vines to hold the Jedi ship in place. That is until they blow the airlock, jettisoning nearly all the Drain Gear in the Nile into space! Unfortunately, the damage has been done, and even though the idols are back in place, the Drain Gear have been released to wreak havoc throughout the galaxy. Speaking of havoc, on a separate mission, Master Skier, accompanied by Jedi Knights Keith Trinis, Sarah, and Tarek, survey the wreckage of a ship from a Nile attack. On board, they find a dead hut, leading Skier to go full Trandoshan on a stranded Nile, because that's what Trandoshans do. The mission leads to the group unraveling a mystery, taking them to City or Minor, ultimately driving Sarah and Skier to go crazy pants thanks to the Drangir's malevolent hive mind. Leaving all of us wondering, where's the story gonna go next? Who are the Drangir? Why are these plants so mean? What does Wayseeker music sound like? And how is Skier gonna live with plants for arms? Star Wars, it's a journey, y'all. My name is Michael Seguin, and I'm the creative director of publishing for Lucasfilm. My name is Troy Alders, and I'm the art director here at Lucasfilm and Disney. My name is Jeffrey Thomas, and I am a senior illustration manager for Disney Publishing. When you're looking at art for the High Republic, story really comes first. We get some basic ideas from the authors of where we're headed, what we want to do, where we want to go. In this case, we had a list of archetypes from the authors, and the first person we went to was artist Phil Noto. And asked him to riff on some ideas that we had come up with and he delivered some truly amazing artwork and so we took some of that art and then ran with it and created all new characters based upon what he delivered. I've been at Lucasfilm since the 90s, a little bit before Shadows of the Empire started and The High Republic is only the second time in my many years here at Lucasfilm that we have the opportunity to actually develop characters and create characters and create worlds. For this one, you know, we, we hired a lot of artists, freelance artists all over the world. It's not often we can do mood boards and it's not often we can do concept art for an initiative like this. So this is really exciting because we get to kind of start from ground zero. When it comes to picking artists, we look for authenticity first and foremost. We want to make sure that the artist is going to capture some of what we all love about Star Wars. And speaking with Troy, there was really only one other person that we could go to and that was Ian McKaig. Ian McKaig is a big deal because he designed the look of Darth Maul. 
He created the look of Padme Amidala. He has that history with Star Wars. Ian came up with dozens and dozens of amazing sketches. From there, we went out to different artists to say, okay, we need an artist who can draw really classic style. We need an artist who can give us monsters and weird aliens. And then we try to align content with those artists. The way we approach creating all the amazing art we've done for this new era of Star Wars is, I mean, like anything, you have to go back to the source material. There's been so much art created for all the Star Wars movies, games that are already out there that there are definitely a ton of designs that no one has ever seen that have never been used. So we will go back to those initially and it just fits perfectly into our era of Star Wars. We also use that as like a spring board to give us inspiration and ideas to help add on to what's already been created. In the beginning, Kathleen Kennedy did give us some thoughts and she definitely wanted it to have some lineage and some connection to the prequels. So we were conscious about that. You know, there are all kinds of different lightsabers, but there's threads that connect them. You know, we didn't want the Jedi to look exactly like Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan in Phantom Menace, but we did want there to be some connective tissue and some common elements like the adornments of filigree that we put on some of the Jedi robes of characters. Designing Mark Yunro's helmet is a good example of going to some of the existing art that was never used. We were trying to come up with an iconic look, you know, someone that could stand next to Vader and Maul. Mark Yunro's helmet is actually a mix of different helmets that were developed but never released. That process has been used kind of a lot. It's taking two awesome things that while they look amazing, they just didn't fit the movie or book that they were originally designed for. But if we take that and then mix it with this, we have something that works perfectly for the High Republic. What are the most challenging parts of embarking on a project like the High Republic? Is there's a level of quality that's expected that has been defined by so many many artists prior. So going into that and knowing that we have to deliver the best of the best and just wanting to kind of make sure that it reaches a level of excellence. One of the things I love about the High Republic is the diversity throughout. We have this amazing team of artists and the artists are literally all over the world. We have characters of every shape, size, species, ethnicity, and that's the beauty of it, right? We want readers to be able to see themselves in the High Republic and we want them to see a very, very big galaxy. Let's celebrate that. We're very excited about the characters we've created, about the artists who are working on it, and this is only the beginning. This is just the tip of the iceberg. One of the greatest questions in all of Star Wars is how can you possibly follow up the story surrounding the great disaster in the High Republic? Well, thanks to my next guest, we now know how. With giant evil plants and buckets of blood. And here to tell us how the heck they came up with these ideas are Claudia Gray, author of Into the Dark, Daniel Jose Older, author of IDW's Higher Public Adventures, and executive editor for Disney Lucasfilm Publishing, Jennifer Heddle. Da -da 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 -da. Welcome, guys. Happy to be here. Hey, hey. I have been knee deep in High Republic for months now, and you guys have been for years. So I want to go ahead and say, for those that haven't read the books yet, how do your stories fit into the story we know so far? I'll start with you, Claudia. How does my story fit in? Into the Dark takes place over to the side, I would say, of the principal narrative of The Great Disaster but it illustrates some other angles of that disaster, some other ways that it affects the galaxy at large, and I would say even another kind of look at the Nile. So the adventure may look very separate from the main narrative, but it really is not. And we kind of see that. I think it starts out as such a light adventure and you're like, he doesn't want to go. We're going to stick with this and he's going to get there, which we always know if you're on your way somewhere in Star Wars, you're probably not going to get there in the way that you assumed. <laughs> yeah, there's not a good track record, is there? Now I'm imagining the Star Wars, like, you know, the airplane board. Remember airports and airplanes and flights? They'd have delayed, like all of the Star Wars things would be like, delayed, delayed, delayed. Destination exploded, delayed. There's just so much that happened. And DJ, I have to ask, where do your comics fit into the story that we've read thus far with the High Republic? So we know about the great disaster um, and we know about the emergencies that are smaller disasters that happened as a fallout from that. 
and this is a little bit later and some new emergences happen and the nearest ship is the Starhopper which is full of Padawans who are just out on kind of a gap year basically hanging out with Master Yoda trying to learn about being a Jedi in the galaxy and turns out they really have to step up and save some lives. They do. Also, there's a really great parallel between Lula and Zine that I have a lot of questions about because they look like they could possibly be the same person and maybe there's some backstory going on there. Are we going into, I don't know, maybe some dark side stuff that we don't know about? Or the Nile, the sorry, I have a lot of questions, <laughs> but we're gonna get to those later. Jennifer, you've been a part of some of the biggest Star Wars literary projects, but how exciting is it to be able to go to a different era of this galaxy? Yeah, it's really exciting. I mean, I've really been loving it from the very beginning. The biggest appeal for me is that we're able to create what I think of as a family, because I tend to think of the Star Wars characters that I love as one big family. And what I really love about the High Republic is that we're bringing this entire new, you know, I guess cast of characters would be more appropriate, but I'm sticking with family to readers to fans and just being able to create new characters that people love and become attached to and new relationships that's really been the most exciting part of it for me daniel what makes the drain gear so scary and so powerful well the drain gear are connected to the dark side so right there that is terrifying right the other thing is they're plants that can eat you it's like the hunter is hunted it is terrifying as someone who enjoys a salad Maybe I never will again. <laughs> it kind of, it makes me think of the people eating tree and poltergeist. Right. I mean, that was oh. terrifying, right? That tree is scarier than the tree that Yoda's like, oh, that's the dark side. It's like, that tree's just sitting there. The tree and poltergeist, it does not like you. The drink gear, it's like Little Shop of Horrors, but with uh, fewer jokes and less singing. I'm really glad that you said that because every time the drink gear say me, I hear it in Audrey 2's voice, and it's a really exciting callback. I wanna know what that meeting was like trying to decide, what are the Drangir gonna say? Oh, they're gonna call them meat, just meat, and meat isn't gonna become a terrifying word from a plant. Just like Daniel immediately started talking about salad when he was talking about the Drangir. We're the meat, humans are meat. Those things that move around, that's just what you feed into their version of the Venus flytrap. So yeah, the meat. And nobody really enjoys being called the meat, do they? No. Jen, what was it like for you to just see the creative process and to be a part of creating a whole new world for Star Wars? Yeah, that was really fantastic. We really wanted to come up with something that felt fresh and different and hadn't really been done before. One of my favorite parts really was just watching our five authors bounce off of each other. And we had ideas going up on the board and Daniel scribbling dinosaurs. It was so great because it was just unpredictable and a little chaotic, but in the very best way. It was a lot of fun. It sounds like it has to be a great experience to just be able to be around so many creative people and be a part of that creative process. But how do you decide who gets to write what stories? We fight it out. <laughs> Were these fights atop dinosaurs? As soon as Daniel can arrange it, they will be, I feel confident. Look, dinosaur gladiators is what needs to happen in Star Wars right now. Is this an exclusive? Are we getting tea right now? Are there going to be dinosaur gladiators? Who's gonna take on the Drengear if not dinosaur gladiators? You know what, this is going a whole other direction. I'm about to get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, the others are gonna be really surprised when we come on. We're like, guess where the higher folks <laughs> going next, guys? Dinosaur gladiators, just revise. Stop giving them spoilers. Oh, yeah. Don't tell them what's about to happen. What is this show if not spoilers? Daniel, I have a very important question. I'm ready. Buckets of blood. Buckets of blood! The most interesting fact about him is that he does not like to do harm. He actually is there to help. I would like you to explain a little bit more of that because I'm so excited about it that I am at a loss for words. But how did you come up with this concept for buckets of blood being the opposite of what you think? So Buckets of Blood is a healer, not a fighter. He actually really does hate fighting. Buckets of Blood is actually based on um, an old time medic from when I was a medic, but even before that time, he actually predated my years as a medic in New York City, but he was kind of like the street lore medic, like people talked about Buckets of Blood all the time. And part of the reason that it said that way is because he would actually come up on the air on EMS radio, probably illegally, to turn down jobs that he didn't think were cool enough 
And so everyone was like, oh my God, buckets of blood. Like, who was that dude? And I filed it away. And I was like, one day I will come up with a character that is worthy of the nickname Buckets of Blood, who is a healer with the goriest name possible. Claudia, with Into the Dark, you spent a lot of time jumping around with the time hop. As an author, how do you kind of track what's happening and make sure it falls into a cohesive story? Into the Dark primarily takes place during, I guess you would call it the current timeline of the High Republic with the Great Disaster. But there is a subplot that takes us back about 20, 25 years to when two of the adult Jedi on the mission, Comac Vitus and Orla Jereni, are themselves Padawans. I think it tells you more about who Orla and Comac both are. You get a little bit of background into how they evolved into the two fairly non-conforming Jedi that they are. And they do have a really great vibe that I really enjoyed. As far as Orla Jereni, do you think that those events that happened 25 years prior are the reason that she did become the way seeker that she is? If it's not why she became a way seeker, I think it's how Orla began the realization that was gonna lead her to becoming a way seeker, if that makes sense. I think she already sensed that maybe she was a little bit out of step with some things in the order at large, but this was the first time maybe during this adventure that she learns to appreciate that and to see that as something else that she brings as a Jedi, not a flaw that she has to compensate for. One of the things that I have found interesting about the High Republic is that we do see the, not only the Jedi, but the Padawans questioning a lot more than we do in the later series of Star Wars. Are we seeing the origins of the dark side coming back? I think in a way it's the opposite, actually. It's that like, we've always known the Jedi at war, right? So what we're seeing now instead is the Jedi at their peak. And because of that, they get to think about the force in ways that we never got to see them think about the force and wonder like, what is my role? You know, what does the force mean to me? Like all these deeper questions that you kind of have the luxury of being able to ask when you're not constantly under attack. I agree with all of that, but I would also add, the dark side never goes away. Ever. I mean, it is a part of the force. It's inextricable. Maybe it isn't organized into the shapes that we remember with the Sith and the First Order and the Empire, but that doesn't mean it's not there. It's always there. Certainly the Drengir are fairly steeped in the dark side of the force. There's always darkness for the Jedi to combat. And DJ, I have a question. You get to work with a Yoda that can fight with a young, nimble Yoda. <laughs> What's it like to be able to create some backstory for Yoda? It's so much fun. Like it's it's the most fun I've had as a writer, I think maybe my entire writing career. Like we've seen Yoda fight before, obviously. This is a Yoda that is like ready to jump into the fight. This is a different Yoda than we've ever met. And yeah, I'm really having the time of my life writing. It has to be a great thing. And Claudia, you've written stories in the Skywalker era and throughout, what's it like for you to essentially be creating this new era of Star Wars? The best thing about it is also the hardest thing about it, which is that there isn't as much Star Wars existing canon to bounce off of. But as we keep going with this, we're creating that canon, we're creating that structure. And I'm gonna be able to refer to everybody else's work going forward and have that format. It has been a real treat to be able to invent so much and have so much freedom. Now, as far as the characters in these stories, how closely did you work with the artists on creating characters? As you said, we didn't have the canon to pull from aside from a couple characters like Yoda. For me, I think that's been one of the coolest parts of the whole project is that we've been in constant conversation with the artists and it's not solely us being like, okay, this is what it's gonna be, do this, do that. No, it's really been like, in exchange. They've been sending us concept art this whole process. Basically, from even before we landed on the High Republic, we were looking at concept art of different ideas that we had been throwing around. And then on my end, like Harvey Tully Bao is also incredible, the artist for the High Republic Adventures. And we've been having a blast too, just coming up with new characters and bouncing ideas back and forth. No matter what I write, it comes out looking epic because it's Harvey. And that is truly a gift. So I just try to write stuff that is like worthy of his epic artwork, basically. <laughs> and then one of the coolest parts about being a writer in this whole era and getting to read great books like Into the Dark 
is being able to be like, ooh, which characters can I borrow and like have hang out with the Padawans? Or like, you know, what's gonna happen down the road that I could possibly use this character for, that character for? Like, it's a totally different experience of reading, knowing that like those characters might be available for something that we're gonna do later. And it's so much fun. There was a great moment when I was reading Out of the Shadows that's coming this summer. And Wreath is in that. I don't think that's giving much away since he's on the cover. Obviously, Claudia wrote Wreath first and we got to know him really well and Into the Dark. I just remember reading a scene by Justina with Wreath in it and I smiled and said that's so Wreath like it was just so great that you know she had managed to also take the essence of that character and was keeping it going forward I love seeing that across the different authors it's really great seeing the way that you weave this beautiful story across books with heroes that we get to invest in and then see pop back up from story to story it has been an absolute pleasure to have you all here on the very first ever second episode of Star Wars The High Republic Show. In The Force Awakens, explorer Lor Santeca gives Poe Dameron a map to Luke Skywalker. And in Light of the Jedi, we learn there's a long lineage of Santeca explorers. Centuries ago, the Santecas were a wealthy family of prospectors, charting and selling newly discovered hyperlanes, making it safer to travel quickly throughout the galaxy. Following the Great Disaster, Husbands Marlo and Velis Santeca provided the Jedi with algorithms and navulators to help predict new debris emergencies to save other systems from Hetzal's fate. But like the Jedi, the Nile have their own Santeca, the elderly imprisoned Mari, who uses her unique gift of seeing and charting movements through hyperspace, helping the Nile stay one step ahead of the Jedi as they chart paths across the galaxy. So if you ever need to find someone, something, or somewhere in the galaxy, you better find a Santeca. Since our last episode, we've received a deluge of your higher public questions online using the hashtag THRSQuestions. And as your only internet friend with the ability to ask the people responsible for the answers, it's my solemn duty to deliver. After all, that's what internet friends do for one another. And this month, we've got Lucasfilm's Jason Stein. Hey, Jason. Hey, Christina. Wraith5 asks, there are a lot of similarities between the Nile of the High Republic and the Cloud Riders of Solo, especially visually. Of course, I might be reading into it. Was any inspiration taken from those proto-rebels when creating the Nile. As Star Wars has done since the original trilogy, we look to find design inspiration grounded in our real world. With the Nile, when we were discussing the visual aesthetic we wanted to achieve, we referenced the punk rock movement and found historical inspiration in the Viking culture. Through those initial inspirations, we evolved and have arrived at the design you see now. It's important to mention that though the Nile and the Cloud Riders may be visually similar, they have very different ideologies, where the Cloud Riders saw themselves as revolutionaries who were trying to make the galaxy a better place, the Nile are, well, nihilistic and just want to see the galaxy burn. Granted, there's a lot of years between the High Republic and Solo, plenty of time for things to change. Now Chase is wondering, we know Avar Chris views the Force as music, Buryaga's trees, and Bella's flames. Will we know how the other Jedi perceive the Force? Yeah, sure. I think with the great number of Jedi at this point on the timeline, at the height of the Republic, there's lots of opportunity for us to see how various members of the Order perceive that connection to the Force, especially as we continue to expand our cast of characters with future High Republic storytelling. Well, thanks so much, Jason. And remember, if you have a burning High Republic query, send it to us online using the hashtag THRSQuestions, and maybe you'll get an answer on our next episode in May. Now listen, as our time together starts winding down, it wouldn't be an episode of the High Republic show if it didn't leave you with some hot new exclusives. That's exclusives for those of you not hip to the way that cools like me talk on the internet. And while we still might be a few months away from digging into Justina Ireland's new book, Out of the Shadows, we simply couldn't wait to officially reveal the main character, Sylvester Yaro. Sylvester is the captain of the Switchback, a cargo ship hauling cargo across the galaxy. But space is lonely. And luckily, Sylvester has her longtime security droid and Celestin co-pilot, Nito, to keep her company. And she'll need them too. Especially when her ship is attacked by the Nile, leaving her in over her head, facing off against not only the Nile, but the Jedi Knights of the High Republic and her ex-girlfriend. Word. Next week, we will see the arrival of the third issue of Star Wars The High Republic Adventures, and with it, a new look at the Nile monster, the Bogaranth. Bogaranths are hungry beasts used in a battle arena by the Nile that leave a trail of slime wherever they go, because hey, why not? Plus, 
Kids love slime. We are also excited to announce Kevin Scott's new audiobook set in the higher public era titled Tempest Runner, following the villainous Lorna D coming into her own as a leader amongst the Nile. But it's lonely at the top, as she's always looking over her shoulder for potential threats to her place in the pecking order, either from the Jedi or the Nile themselves. And you can listen to the story yourself when it releases this fall. Now, if you're like me, you've probably taken copious notes trying to keep up with all the new characters and names found in all the books so far from the higher public era. Well, luckily for you, we've created a couple of hands Dandy dandy visual aids to help you navigate your way through the higher public. First, there's this character connectivity matrix focusing on a few of the heroic characters. Now we should note it's not 100% complete, but it does give you a good look at where some of the more important characters fall on the side of the light. And if you wanted a printable version of the timeline, we've got that for you too! The timeline charts out the basics of who's in what story, what happens when, etc. And while you can read them in any order you like, we highly suggest release order. You can check it out right now at starwars.com forward slash the higher public, where we also also have brand new character posters from Into the Dark, including Appy Hollow, the co-pilot of the vessel. And remember, there's still more High Republic content to look forward to between now and May in the form of new issues of Marvel Star Wars The High Republic, as well as IDW's High Republic Adventures, written by Kevin Scott and Daniel Jose Older. In fact, we're proud to show you the final cover for Marvel's The High Republic number no. 7 by Kevin Scott and IDW's High Republic Adventures number no. 6 by Daniel Jose Older. Busy, busy, busy. And there are always new updates coming throughout that you can find first on StarWars.com forward slash the high republic so you'll want to check back early and often and as always remember to like the video subscribe to the channel thanks for watching and may the force be with you now if you'll excuse me i've got to dump gallons of pesticide on all my potted plants just to be safe from the drain gear